But, but sir, it was trapped in ice and it Isn't melted that out. Gamera? Yeah, Gamera has a lot of different origins. Um, yeah, I think that's the original one. <laughs> it was trapped in ice and they melted. Yeah. Um, those old Gamera movies are just a grand old time. I've actually rewatched yeah, one of them on Mystery Science Theater, the iconic one where they make a new theme song for him. With the Gamera is really neat. Gamera is made of meat. We believe in Gamera. Good times. Good, good times. Or just like the moment where like there's silence for a while and then Gamera starts like doing his Olympic flip around like a pole. And just one of them goes, I just realized how weird this movie is. This is the Spectator Film Podcast. Welcome. This week, we're not doing that movie, but we totally should be, we based should. on your description of it. He goes to the Olympics. What <laughs> What does he do? Is he doesn't he like go to the Olympics, thrower? unfortunately, but like he does like a gymnastics like spin around this random pole that's there for some reason. It doesn't look good. It looks really weird and out of place, but that's the great thing about the Gamera movies is like they unintentionally added a comedic element to kaiju movies before Godzilla, like intentionally started doing it when they were targeting a before younger Godzilla audience. started flying through the air feet first. Yeah. Before the cinematic masterpiece that is Godzilla versus Megalon. Yeah. But we're not doing that movie. No, we are doing Godzilla destroy all monsters, all of them, every single one. Um, this, yeah, as we said, this is spectator film podcast. I'm Max. He's Austin. Hello. Uh, yeah, this was, if you couldn't guess my pick, um, I'm a huge, huge yeah, kaiju movie fan in general. Um, I started watching them when I was young, as many people do. And when I was watching them at a younger age, I was obviously like, oh, there are big, cool monsters that are going to fight each other. And then I can ignore this and play my Game Boy while all the boring people are talking. Um, and then... Boy, oh boy, can you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but as I got older, like they kept making these movies. And I'm just like what did I see in these when I was a kid? So I started going back and watching the ones I remember watching, watching different yeah, series, different creators. And I'm just like, Oh, there's, there's actually more to these than I remember. There's like cultural symbolism in all of these movies. And it's really interesting watching like people have talked ad nauseum about the original uh, Godzilla movie. I had to write a paper for it in college, uh, comparing that, to the uh, 1954 American film Them, uh, how the original Godzilla was a representation of nuclear war from somebody who was a victim of it versus how Them was a view of it from the country that had unleashed it. And it's two very different sides where it's an uncontrollable destructive force from the Japanese point of view. For America, it's a threat, but it's nothing the strength and determination of the American military can't contain. Because we're strong and responsible. But, yeah, film criticism of the Godzilla series kind of fizzles out in serious academic circles after the first one. Because after that, it's just like, oh, they're goofy, silly monster fight movies, and there's not much more to analyze here. I see where people are coming from with that. I would disagree with that and say there's a lot more to talk about. I won't get too much into that because we want to dive into this fun adventure but austin what's your history with godzilla movies? well first of all i would say i i agree with the premise that most academic people would tend to focus on the first godzilla movie um but i will say that i did in terms of actual research like a limited amount of digging before this movie but in terms of just finding different resources i found quite a few on the kaiju genre the difference i think is that people would write like I don't know, like a monograph or like, you know, they would publish essays about the first Godzilla movie. Yeah. And then after that, it's treated like in mass. It's like, and then there's all the other ones that came mm. after it. But when you have something that's going on for so long, and even though there's diminishing returns financially, clearly the reason why it still exists today is because it's popular. Yes. And that means it has some sort of connection to people. Godzilla, I think, is one of those movie things that is like comparable maybe to Frankenstein, where it be has become reached a level of iconic uh, recognition for people, right? It's like a marketing team's wet dream. It's so yeah. easy. Uh, so, like, I think most academic studies have stopped maybe treating the series like individually as movies after the first one. And then it becomes more of that like cultural idea of Godzilla, which is interesting on its own, but we're doing neither of those things today. 
I guess I don't know how we're going to approach this movie. But there's a lot of things to talk about with this. Well, yeah. Also, because I didn't. This is the one I chose, and I kind of almost regretted my choice once I pitched this to you. Why? Because um, there's another one which I chose. Th- I chose this one one because it's a good conglomerate of all the early Godzilla movies. Sure. This was originally going to be the last Godzilla movie, so they just threw every fucking in monster the, puppet they had in the, there. The uh, show Shua era it, era yeah, Shoa era. Um, right. But they so there's that i'm just like oh if we're gonna be talking about kaiju movies why not do the one that was supposed to be the be all end all for that yeah era? they're all in it um then i'm just like uh but if we're gonna be talking about like an actually well-made film and something that's an inspiration for the upcoming godzilla movie from the director of trick-or-treater krampus which i'm actually against all rational odds excited for um Maybe we should be doing uh, Godzilla, Mothra, King Ghidorah, Giant Monsters All Out Attack. But uh, hey, we could still do that one. We could. Maybe we'll do it that. It might be a little bit redundant. Yes. <laughs> but I'm sure we could. I'm there. I'm sure there's entire podcasts about kaiju movies, even just about like Toho, like yeah. Godzilla franchise movies. But at any rate, my experience with the Godzilla movies is I, I watched the fuck out of a few of them as a kid. Yes. And I watched those ones a lot. But in the grand scheme of things, that's only like a small portion of them. Uh, and famously, you've mentioned Krampus. If you listeners have heard that episode, which mm-hmm. I'd be very surprised if you're returning to this podcast after that, uh, or after any of our episodes, frankly. Yeah, exactly. Um, you will know, Max points out, that I have a copy of Godzilla's Revenge. It's our, uh, it's our mascot at this point. Yeah, just that DVD copy right of Godzilla's Right on Revenge. the counter for some reason in front of us all the time when we record. And that one was the one I watched the most. The absolute worst fucking one, apparently. Yeah. But I couldn't tell because... You were a dumb kid. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, And that movie is certainly weird when I think about it. I haven't seen it in 20 years. Maybe we'll do that one, too. Uh, But aside from that, I watched the bastardized uh, Roland Emmerich shit fest. And then I, I think my favorite of them as a kid was Godzilla 2000, which I think I can safely say after not having seen it in over a decade probably would hold up and still be fun it's it holds up better than the roland emmerich one i can give you that (laughs) i (laughs) was not worried about that at all (laughs) uh but yes so that's pretty much my experience i also probably have equal amount of exposure to it in terms of uh like that game boy game i was just so addicted to that game i Um, loved it oh yeah i actually have that on my phone i have the game boy i I know you showed it to me and i like hated you for it it was like (laughs) First, it blew my mind because it's just I hadn't even thought of it in years. And yeah. then I'm like, oh, now I've, I'm just like mad that I don't have this. But anyway, I think that is pretty much my experience with Godzilla at large. I can't remember uh, a time in my life where I where I didn't know what Godzilla was. So it is weird. It's an awesome it, monster that yeah. has just existed in part of my imagination for a long time. And in the cultural imagination yeah. of the entire world. Yeah. And then I went on to go see, like, the original Godzilla movie and stuff like that. Yeah, but just real quick, like, the reason I chose this is, like, the new Godzilla movie is kind of based off of this one. It's a similar concept. Um, And also, besides the fact that there's every monster, there's also a lot of fun miniatures. There's a lot of fun set design in this movie. And also, there's a lot of downtime, which gives us time to talk about some of the themes of the kaiju genre in general. And to get on our soapbox and start preaching about, uh, well, what are we doing this week? Are we going to talk about, uh, if we can do something stressful or something fun. We can talk about like the the virtues of... Um, Let, let's spin the wheel of random political discourse. I wasn't even thinking political, because that would just be upsetting. We could do like, hey... Don't be the guy who talks about Rosé too much. Maybe. Or <laughs> I don't know what things we have that would fall into this uh, this list of things to do. Oh, look, the wheel stopped. It, it landed on, let's shut up and start the podcast. That would be a weird thing to go on a soapbox about. The wheel has spoken. It has. All right, are you ready to begin? Yeah, let's go. Welcome to the movie. Oh yeah, just uh, welcome to 1999. We're watching the uh, Amazon version of this movie. So well, it's on Amazon Prime, but yeah. this version is by uh, Media Blasters or whatever Tokyo Shock. I think yeah. this one. Is, 
I'm not sure. I know they put out a Blu-ray of it a few years ago, and then Toho asked them to take it down because it had all the different versions of the dubs on it. Really? Yeah. I mean, I th- the thing is, I'm a little bit hesitant about this version we're watching because I know it's in English, but I don't know which dub it is. And I'm very suspicious of AIP dubs, which that could be like some sort of boy band or something, but <laughs> AIP dubs. But uh, like... Oh, that is loud. And that is very loud, but you do get the wonderful Godzilla theme. The music in this is great. I love it. Well, they still use the classic Godzilla yeah. reveal music in like every Godzilla movie that comes out. Yeah. But here we go. What are we going to talk about first? Um, besides the fact that we're greeted with like the most charming set of miniatures <laughs> in the history of film. Maybe the thing to talk about first is like the way the camera is interacting with these miniatures. Because this is something that I'm always like enamored with and feel like I wouldn't be able to replicate in the same situation in terms of uh, how Ishiro Honda approaches filming these movies, Um, where these movies are completely made by the fact, when I say made, I mean like they are given longevity and become authentic and entertaining and fun because they do not blink when they show you the miniatures and everything. You know what I mean? There's no winking at you or anything when you see these like miniatures that are obviously miniatures. Yeah, no, and like it would be bad if like the movie tried to hide that and it was just like, oh, we're going to do really close shots and we're going to pretend this doesn't look... No, this this is the set we have. We're going to have tiny toy cars driving on it. And then later we're going to light them on fire. (laughs) Yes. But also it's like, it's not even that it doesn't blink. It like, it is enamored with that stuff. Which kind of makes you as an audience member, if you appreciate this kind of stuff at all, like it makes you enamored with it. Too. Yes. It's like, there's a certain degree of sincerity in how it embraces this material, which is, I mean, we all know that it can be silly. Yeah. <laughs> right. But it embraces it so wholeheartedly. We've that all it's seen like, Godzilla versus Megalon. Like e- exactly. Max. Everyone, if you haven't seen that movie, you've seen the gifts. Yeah. You definitely have. Just look up Godzilla, uh, Godzilla on, flying, uh, Godzilla feet, Godzilla, whatever, uh, Godzilla jet Jaguar theme song. Oh, um, that you should look up that and yeah. listen to it while you're looking up the gifts. Yes. You're going to have yourself a good time, but yeah. So like the sincerity of it makes these movies, um, at least the Ishiro Honda ones that I've seen, like very easy to engage with and definitely gives them that type of longevity that would otherwise make it feel kind of like stale and you know, exploitative. Cause I mean, these, they were pumping these movies out. These were like cash grabs at a certain point for them. Oh yeah. Like the, right. some of the costumes started falling apart in the movie. Cause yeah. like we said, this was supposed to be the last one. It wasn't. Um, but in some of the later ones, like you it can, never s- is. you can see the Godzilla suit, like parts of the armor falling off and shit. Like yeah. they're pumping these out and just not re-upping the costumes or anything. They're just- yeah. And you need somebody to commit to it in that way to give it any sort of, I don't know if integrity is the word, but like it needs to feel like there's an emotional investment by the people who made it, right? Otherwise, it does feel cynical. Yes. Um, oh, we're gonna land on a monster land or monster island or. Uh, I definitely don't want to call it monster land because that no. just sounds like <laughs> monster island is what Thank they end you. up calling That's, it later. There on, you go. Rodan. Yeah, but we get this like almost pseudo nature documentary thing of just like look at all the yeah. monsters living in harmony. Well, it's probably we're going to get back to the like type of sincerity and how they go about filming all this stuff later. But probably a good thing to bring up now is like usually in these movies, even though I haven't seen a lot of them is like, you expect this dichotomy or sort of um, you have this uh, perhaps you might use the word dialectic between sort of like the natural order of the world and then the science and humanity going too far reaching beyond their grasp. Right. And that is very much present in like the first Godzilla movie. Whereas here it's interesting because it's actually introducing the entire movie with this completely different shift where it's like everything we're seeing right now is like, well, first of all, it's the future world of 1999. Yes. We're but in it's the an far op- distant future of 1999. Exactly. And, uh, it's an optimistic future because science and natural order have reached a type of like synthesis and they can, there's balance here. They can live with one another, right? We're not trying to kill the monsters. We're not trying to use them for our own gain. It's just like, hey, we're going to put you in this area where you have plenty of stuff to eat and you're not going to bother any humans. Yeah. You'll be fine. And we're like preserving your habitat. Yeah. Yeah. We have reached a point where our scientific technology can achieve a type of like utopian balance between science and nature. 
and that's how we're beginning the movie. So it's interesting that this sort of, um, I don't know, this battle of these two, like, I don't know, this dichotomy that seems to drive all the other movies is shown here in this future world as like being resolved. And I, I love how the, like the second you might have a question, you're like, okay, so Godzilla and the other ones like are kept in by like a gas field, but like Rodan can fly. Why doesn't he sleep? It's like magnets, a, Max. The magnetic fields. Magnets. I do kind of love like it's fun for scale. Like we see, ro- like we see like stock footage of dolphins, and then we see like Rodan diving in and just like eating a dolphin like it's a small little guppy. I like that. It's world building for like how these things live in the wild. And at the same time, it's just like, oh yeah. Reminding how big these things are. Yeah. Especially since in these kind of movies, you can tell they're just kind of puppets on strings. But And I mean, I, we, I think we can both enjoy the artistry of just a good miniature in the first place. Yeah. But the if way we could in this movie it might be miserable. Oh, yeah. But. I mean, they are good miniatures, but also they're like shot in this very like enamored way, which I think is, Again, speaks to the sincerity we were talking about. But, like, more specifically, this movie is enamored with this idea of, like, this future world technology. Yeah. And it. Speaking of which, looking, they're watching five different Godzilla exa- movies on yes, the screens exactly. at one time. You couldn't do that back then, Max. Yeah. It was really revolutionary for them to imagine that. You have five monitors on the same screen. Oh, look at the map of the island. <laughs> it looks like a kid's science project. I love it. But it's perfect. It I love perfect. these like '60s, like control rooms. No, sets. it is very Star yeah. Trek. Just like simple, flat. Blinky oh, we'll lights. fucking see that later with the oh <laughs> the yeah. spaceship that's painted green on yeah. the inside. Oh boy, classic colors. But yeah, uh, is this the time? Also, if we're talking about how enamored this movie is with technology, I don't know if they saw 2001 while it, they were it, making this. It came out the same year, right? I believe so. This is just so fucking strikingly similar, though. I think it, even if they didn't, I think like that sort of to- zeitgeisty. Yeah, yeah, it was in the water for everything, especially like that era of space exploration. Or Japan is across quite a bit of water. It is, but Japan was and still is influenced by American yeah. cinema to a degree. Well, if we can also start bringing up that and just at large in Japanese cinema, particularly in this part of the uh, 20th century this idea of, you know, finding a national identity and trying to establish Japan that retains the good parts of its roots as the, you know, real traditional Japan, while also being able to be relevant in a modern world without succumbing to total westernization uh, is, is something that I think pops up thematically and subtextually in a ton of really like high profile Japanese movies around this time. Yeah. And that's definitely something that comes up in the Godzilla franchise as well. And here, if we're talking about the technology and stuff and how this movie considers, you know, its relationship ideologically with America, there's some interesting stuff because as we'll see, this is (laughs) okay. This is just, Oh, there's gas. Oh, I better open the door. (laughs) You know what we got to mention right now? We've got to mention that we're not going to comment upon the utterly inexplicable character things. (laughs) Yes, in this movie, because I have to be honest with you, it just doesn't matter. In a, in a good, <laughs> there are a few Godzilla movies where the human characters are interesting, um, or at least fun. I would mention uh, 2004's Godzilla, yeah, Godzilla Final Wars is one. That's because they stop the humans from talking and just have them fucking kung fu matrix fighting for the majority of the movie. Sure, but uh, it solves the most problems in your screenplay. But yes, uh, during a lot of the human elements of this movie, we'll be talking about the kaiju genre as a whole. Well, the thing is, it's like. The the humans in this are sort of, we were talking about this, it's kind of like they're all, you can basically treat every scene with humans as like they're just one character. Yeah. You know, they're all just like human. And it's like this abstract idea of what the humans are trying to do in response to these monsters, you know? Um, they're very much functional for the story and it's it uses them as a skeleton to hang the props on. Uh, but here after this cut, we're going to get our other 2001 reminiscent yeah. image of the circular spaceship. But I guess the point I'm trying to make in terms of how this movie interacts with the idea of like, okay, Japanese national identity established against both the Japanese past and this idea of modernization and, you know, potentially being taken over by Western influence. Uh, this movie envisions a Japanese centric future where it's like, 
Japan has this incredible utopian technology, right? And they use it to maintain this, you know, order and keep the monsters at bay. They, Japan has reached this level of technological sophistication. They work in cooperation with other yes. nations. It's not like they're trying to lord over them, mm-hmm. but it's just like, no, we are the ones who will contain this problem when the UN comes to deal with it. It's yeah. mainly Japanese people. There are a couple of token white Westerners in the background. There's one guy who, like, I think he says, like, by Jiminy at one point. Yeah. I'm like, is he British? Is yeah. he sp- that guy? Who that is guy, that guy? I think he's supposed to be British. Um, well, he's dead now, so. Yeah. Good luck to you, sir. <laughs> anyway. <Wow. laughs> Jesus. No, but like back in the science lab on Monster Island, we had like a couple of yeah, white lady scientists in yeah. the background. Like, it is an international yeah. uh, sort of uh, initiative. But the, I guess the point, I'm, that's an important thing to mention though, is yeah. that like, it's not that Japan is in total control. It's that Japan is a nation that participates on a global level with other big time countries. Right. They're not being bullied by the U.S. or the Soviet Union. You know, they're they have agency on a national level. And when, you know, they keep the, the, the monsters on a Japanese island and what other nations depend on Japan to keep those monsters secure. Otherwise, there's horrible consequences. Yeah. As we see, like particularly for the French. Oh, yeah. The French are utterly devastated. La Pelle de Bois. Oh, no. It's destroying the heart of Paris. Uh, it's Gorosaurus. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, because, like, Japan's containment of these monsters fail. There goes Stonehenge. And all of a sudden, <laughs> it's chaos. The, the You think the rest of the world, like, especially America, would, like, be trying to build up things to as fail-safes for this. But no, it's just we're utterly fucked the second that Japan's containment. Yeah, Japan is spearheading the effort. Yes. And that was a joke. They destroyed the Arc de Triomphe. Uh, but it is heavily implied in this movie that they destroy Ho- Stonehenge as well. Is it? Yes. Is Stonehenge in a major city? Anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's in, in the Queen's backyard. That's how England works. Anyway, the, I think that's a, this is a good time to bring up the some of the effects. Because, like, yes, the fire breath looks like an effect added on, but like the actual explosion and stuff, like you can tell they're just like blowing up their props and right. lighting stuff on fire. Well, I mean, we should probably mention too, that this type of, uh, model work and, um, filming, you know, the people in the rubber outfits interacting with these models and getting that right. I don't know if it's an entirely lost art. <laughs> I, I just can't think of many people doing it the same way nowadays. I haven't seen a lot of the recent Godzilla movies. Maybe they do that. No, to the same extent, but it's like, there, it is very much a specific skill set that I think, you know, we're going to talk about the kaiju genre as a whole. And, you know, it was a global genre, but most mostly it was these movies in Japan. And I have a feeling that that art is mostly done at this place and at this point in time in history. And I can't think of many other instances where it's ever done in the same way, which is kind of a shame because it's interesting. It is. It has a really interesting look to it. And, like, the 90s and, like, early 2000s uh, Godzilla movies, at least from Japan, like, there were still miniatures. There were still, like, yeah, some things in suits, but, like, it was slowly modernizing. And, like, Shin Godzilla had a lot of practical effects in it, but there was still, like, a lot of CGI. I think Shin Godzilla, which is, as of now, until the next American one comes out, the most recent Godzilla film, Mm -hmm. um, that movie looks great, um, and it is stepping back from like the kaiju fight genre and more of like let's it's kind of a almost a spiritual remake of the first one where it's just like oh let's watch godzilla slowly be born and evolve and turn into this thing and watch as it fights japan but yeah here's another good moment just to mention of like just if we're talking about the way that this movie really is enamored with technology we get all these great tracking shots alongside this prop as it moves and is this where they say they're headed to a swamp no that's, that's later, later on in the movie <laughs> well, we're gonna have to ju- fucking double check on that one just land just land on the swamp next to the moon you know yeah. not next to the moon max well, on the mo- well then land next to the swamp on the moon sorry yeah. but that'd be yeah that was a random line that we caught while watching we were like wait what excuse me they may as fucking well have said that because it makes just as much sense <laughs> at least to us I'm no moon scientist, but I got to say that that uh, made me pause for a second. But yeah, if we're going to talk about the way this looks, right? The first thing to mention is that obviously 
it's artificial. They're using a lot of artifice, right? And I don't think people at the time would have expected it to look, it's not like they thought it looked like, like yeah. it's not like they were looking for verisimilitude in these movies. But one of the interesting things uh, that we sort of came across and I think, what is the name of the book? We found a decent book about this stuff. and I, I think actually really like the book. I've been reading a lot of it. The Kaiju uh, Film? Who yes, wrote it? The Kaiju Film um, is a wonderful, wonderful book. It's one of the few like interestingly like and passionate critical analyses of uh, the genre in general. A lot of guy- yeah, Godzilla stuff, but also a lot of Gamera things. Um, it's available on Amazon as much as I would like people not to buy it off there just but tell uh, me who wrote it oh sorry it's written, yeah, written by jason Barr. <laughs> jason Barr. okay um, well he compares it to and i'll just quote the passage in the show notes but he compares it to this type of um specifically japanese puppetry which i'm gonna hazard a guess at how this is pronounced bunraku i don't know sure please correct us if you exist listeners like comment and subscribe if we're wrong yeah but anyway um he compares it to that and then that when he started talking about that, that was fascinating because it kind of recontextualized the way I imagined, you know, them as filmmakers really embracing and buying into like what they're doing with sincerity. Because if you place this type of storytelling within some sort of visual or, um, I don't know, storytelling tradition that's specific to your culture, right? Yeah. It feels like, like you're not it, whenever when you know that it's not trying to do anything in terms of being achieving verisimilitude at all, but instead it's actually trying to achieve something that existed before it, and it's participating with a lineage of something. It makes me consider it differently, and I guess it almost actually makes the way they embrace it less bold because it's like, oh, there's a precedent for this, and it's participating in a tradition. That doesn't make it less like effective. It just makes it less like. Well, conspicuous you, when they embrace it. And it's interesting because like when you look at, because that sort of creates a cultural distance when you watch these movies because yeah. it's something that, if it's sort of a natural evolution of an art form that's been going on in Japan for a long, long time, even if like you grew up in Japan and you like, you weren't like a fan of that or you didn't see it that often, like yeah. it's in the cultural psyche, like you're going to be aware you're gonna of it. You're going to have a certain awareness of it on a certain level. Now, Max... We're having a fascinating discussion, but we really have to pause for what is maybe my favorite moment in the movie when they try to get out of these chairs. <laughs> really? Just this? Just the, oh, 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 oh. They may live in a perfect future world, but they fucked up with the design of that spaceship, I've got to say. I do like how, like, the movie, like, they, because they very easily could have had that prop just, like, touch down like that. Yeah. But no, we saw it take off like a traditional yeah. rocket, so it has to land like this, and they're all very rehearsedly, looks like, leaning back in their chairs like that as it lands yeah. vertically. And that's another 2001 thing, right? Is this movie really likes to focus on and elongate the process of like just using future world technology. It's like just interested in just like, we're just going to watch this person who could be doing a completely mundane thing, right? In this world, we're just going to watch them and see how they do it. And they're very like, yeah. And they're very used to it. I like that. Yeah. Like the movie doesn't draw attention to it. It's not just like, wow, isn't it amazing how this spaceship can land vertically and take off vertically? This is great. Now everybody sit in your chairs like this because they're going to do like this. I know it's your first day, Jenkins, so you... Weirdly, though, it's like the camera is doing that, yeah. but they aren't. No, it's this the interesting movie, The movie contrast. doesn't like tell you yeah. how amazing it is. It's just like, oh, isn't this neat? Yeah, it's just the movie is interested in it. But I, I, yeah, I, I was like saying uh, there's a bit of a culture gap in terms of like the... As the puppetry goes. Yeah. Um... Not like, because a lot of movies back then, like, the special effects haven't aged that well. Like, them, I still love them. If I could own one movie prop in history, it would be... Well, it's of its time. Yeah. Yeah. But one of the major criticisms for the Godzilla movies, at least at the time, were just, like, how terrible the dubbing of them was. And so I think that, like, people were kind of used to a cultural, like, a culture shock thing. Because it's just like, oh, this looks really weird and the dubbing is terrible for But this. does that give them, like, a license to be dismissive if they're not interested not, in putting in the effort no, to, like, I, understand? No, I'm implying the opposite, Oh, honestly. okay. Um, that because they're already sort of slightly like, oh, this is going to be different than an American film because of that, because of the weird dubbing and how it doesn't look natural, they might be more accepting of 
other weird stuff that they might not accept in American film because well, they're already accepting it's a Japanese thing. Yeah, that's true. Although I would feel like they would just take that. They would want to take it on its own terms, but they would never assume that there's some sort of sophistication or lineage that it's coming out of. Oh, no, absolutely yeah. not. But I'm saying subconsciously, like as soon as your brain's like, oh, this is a weird foreign thing. They're just like, OK, yeah, I stop expecting it to you know, address me on my own terms, yes. which I guess is something, but it's still kind of dismissive to not. It is. I'm not saying it's yeah. a necessarily a good thing. I'm saying no. that might have been. <laughs> but I do think it's interesting to talk about that because really I had no idea of that type of puppetry, right? Yeah. But it's like when you really think about it and I, since I'm not familiar with it, I don't know how accurate that comparison or assertion is. It's, but if you entertain the possibility, it sort of is like, it makes me feel like, like, wow, people in the U S and their like appraisal of these movies kind of fucked up <laughs> because like, I feel like that would, if they're not aware of that, they would have a much harder time taking these as legitimate. And by legitimate, I mean like just worthy of paying attention. Whereas if it comes from a different source, I think in the eyes of American critics, that would probably legitimize it a lot more. So I don't know. I think that's an interesting conversation to have in terms of how Americans might engage with these movies compared to people who are from Japan. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's always the thing to talk about when you're talking about foreign films in general. I mean, there are films made in different countries that are universal and just sort of tell a story that happens to take mm -hmm. place in a different language or a different place. But there are definitely movies that are products of their culture that you have to try to understand in that cultural context to get the full impact of it. And we're yeah. talking about this like, oh, wow, well, there's a lot of deep... And like, Destroy All Monsters, I don't think, is the best example of this. But Well, it it's just like any sort of competently and like well, how, how should I say this? Well-crafted genre film. It's going to enunciate certain things without necessarily focusing on them, right? And given that the Godzilla franchise, we can talk about how it changes maybe from the first one compared to this one because yeah. it's significant, the changes. Although it continues doing a lot of the same things, uh, it's sort of, you expect that from it to a certain extent, right? I mean, we're being introduced to the key locks now, right? Yes, and we're about to get the very, for me, visually confusing battle where everyone's wearing bright yellow and running around and uh, stuff is happening. They almost look like, I don't know why I'm thinking this, but it's like if Curious George was like a space astronaut, because he wears yellow suits, right? No, that's the man in the yellow hat. Oh, okay. His well, anyway. Friend. Thank you very much. It would be more fun if one of these people ran around with like a sidekick monkey. <laughs> Don't who say is that. like Robinson Crusoe on Mars. No, I'm just thinking. Did I tell you about that? There's a sidekick monkey in that movie. No, I'm just thinking of Speed Racer now. Where you <laughs> is that like, a thing in Speed Racer? Yeah, you have the little kid and you have the monkey that always God, hide that's out. That's a movie people like like to talk about. Online. They do. That movie's making a comeback. It is. Um, I know there's a content creator online. He's not a film guy, but he talks about how he loves that movie so much because he started off as an animator. I'm like. I can get you liking that movie as an animator because you're just like, look, it's an entirely yeah. CGI movie with real action people. But at the same time, it kind of physically hurts me to look at that movie. It well, looks like Lazy Town, the motion picture. To I me. mean, if we're going to really talk about that, let's give Robert some Rodriguez some props. If you're really going to talk, he did that first, didn't he? Uh, sorry, Robert Rodriguez. I'm having I, I love the man, but I'm having flashbacks to like Shark Boy and Lava Girl. Well, anyway, <laughs> which, which, <laughs> which also are in this movie, they get stomped on. Why not? You don't see them. Um, but anyway, uh, we get our, like, by the way, just got to say it. Planet of the vampires. Planet of the Hello. vampires. Yeah. Hello. But anyway, um, expect that eventually. So, uh, we were introduced to the key locks, right? And I think we very fortuitously started talking about the idea of how these movies sort of engage with the culture of their times in a way that is not necessary. It's not allegory, but they tackle things in that way you expect from certain genre stuff. Like, yeah, I know you talk about the idea of, you know, um, different readings of different movies using monsters uh, as like representative of certain things going on at the mm. time, the usual genre analysis that you bring to worthwhile genre movies. Yes. Right. So one thing, and I think we both came across this in the book discussing about, you know, the key locks is, uh, again, right. J oh, this is the best death yeah. face ever. <laughs> he just looks bloated more than my anything. favorite. But anyway, um, in terms of the key locks, right. So this time the drama does not come from scientists being too ambitious and 
fucking greedy, Max. Just downright fucking Messing nasty with greedy. They shouldn't. Yeah. Instead, it's a perfect world that's get it's fucked up by sabotage. Yes. And it's all the fucking key locks. We didn't do shit. It's a they foreign, just invaded. It's a foreign invader saying that they're going to make a perfect society where yeah. there was arguably already one. <laughs> right. Well, not even arguably, yeah. just in terms of how it's depicted. But anyway, it's like at the time, right? This comes out in 1968. Uh that's a we were talking about that. That's a really neat cut, by the way. From then in, in the in the car to this girl wearing heels on the beach. It's very weird. Um, but anyway, so it's 1968. The Japan post-war economy has started to gain some momentum after the war, right? Um, not everything is rosy yet, I'm sure. No. Um, they're still right next to Russia and our and allies China, with the U.S. Yeah. And the Korean Height War. Height of the Cold War. The Korean War nerve-wracking. just happened, like... Yeah. Um, very tense sort of geopolitical situation, right? But it's not necessarily as bad as it was, you know, immediately following the... The uh, entire country is not II. still on fire. Right. So the thing with Japan is during the latter half of the 20th century, their GDP started to sort of grow so quickly uh, that it threatened to outstrip the U.S.'s economy. Right. And the reading in the book talks about the key locks as this type of take on a like invasion of the body snatcher esque vision of Americans sort of um, trying to manufacture issues and sabotage Amer- Japanese capitalism. Yeah. To sort of um, pre- prevent sort of, uh, I don't know, equal competition, I guess, or just ensure that there's continual sort of American domination. Of well, because Japanese, in, yeah, in the, in the immediate history after, oh my god, I'm gonna take one break to just talk about like we have this incredibly Here's valuable one, prisoner. another one of those character moments. They're just totally fucked up. Uh. <laughs> you can hear him scream too. Yeah, he <laughs> just opens the window and he's like, ah. okay, whatever. But <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to see that dummy fall. I mean, we have to mention it. But uh, in the immediate aftermath of World War II, as I assume a lot of you know. America dumped a lot of money into the half of Germany that we controlled and the all of Japan that we controlled yeah. to rebuild them into vibrant capitalist allies that would serve uh, our interests in the regions. Um, and then we started noticing, like, wait a minute, why are all these fucking yeah, Volkswagens and Toyotas selling so much better than American cars? And why are all these businesses doing great while right. our economy is starting to There's stagnate? There's actually a line about it in Die Hard. Do you remember this? I, Where he's like, we beat them in World War II, and now they're killing us with the shit they sell us to try to take over our economy. You know what I mean? So it's like this weird thing on both sides, right? But also, even like, though we caused that, yes. Like, so anyway, <laughs> very weird. But that's an interesting take on the key locks, right? This idea of this invasive um, sort of agents that are going to try to sabotage a system that is working. You that know, is working perfectly, and yeah. like they're adding nothing of value to it. They're yeah, they've taken control of the monsters that we had under control, and causing crises, and then trying to be like, "Listen, we just yeah. we want peace. We want everything to be great. Well, You're that, the only one causing bad things to happen." That's the thing that wasn't mentioned in the book, but I think we both picked up on and discussed during the previous screening is this idea that the key locks sort of operate in this like in this way that's kind of like a very inherently capitalist imperative, where it's like okay, we're going to manufacture a need for something. And then we're going to swoop in and say, hey, we have it. Yeah. But now it's like, oh, now you're subordinated to your need for it and subordinated to us because we can provide you with it. So it's like they're they're like creating a market for this thing, right? That's how <laughs> creating, capitalism works. Creating right? a market for not getting killed by Godzilla. It's the same fucking thing as no, those people who sell bulletproof backpacks. Yeah. It's the same thing. It, there's now a market for that and people will fucking buy it and there shouldn't be, it shouldn't exist. So that's how capitalism works, right? You try to find a growth market and then you jump into it when it's on the ground floor and then you try to get it to take off. But that is the imperative they're using to try to conquer the world that when they meet the key locks, they're like, we want to create a perfect scientific utopia. And they're like, like the one you just fucked up, like, yeah. like that one. And they're like an even more perfect scientific utopia. And then they basically just tell them to fuck off. But again, it's an entirely malicious tactic, right? You're manufacturing a lack or a perceived lack in 
the people that you're sort of trying to subordinate. And as long as we're running with that idea, we're just showing the fact that they put yeah, mind control devices in them, which if we're going with that, like when you have an introduction to any sort of like, if we're going with the analogy of like America trying to sabotage like Japan's progress after the war, after realizing that they're doing a little bit too well. Yeah. Um, we could like the best <laughs> way to do dialogue. that is to try to have Japanese people doing it. So like, having the thing of just like, Oh, any yeah. Japanese national who would support this is obviously just like being influenced or being paid by the, yeah, the that's why it's that it. type of invasion of the body snatchers yeah. indoctrination, but Oh, it's captain British here again. Well, he doesn't have the best dialogue in this scene. No doctor man does. It's professor scientist. Yes. I can't tell you what it is, but it really looks like a machine that was used for mind control. <laughs> and I don't know what it's made no, of, but it's some sort of metallic alloy. No, you're like, I don't know what it is, but it's some kind of metal. <laughs> I've never seen one of these before but it looks like they were using it to control her mind using brainwaves <laughs> there's a number of lines like that that are just amazing and just like oh of course why not we should keep you around for everything yeah and then, there is, and then we start to find out that they randomly for some reason their master plan was to hide the brain control devices and like All small the fucking place. small objects randomly around the world yeah i don't know how you incorporate that into the reading of the americans it just seems like a thing although you could say for like trinket consumerism where we just like make you want to buy all this useless crap that doesn't no i'm just <laughs> i'm pulling shit out of my i don't know <laughs> this is great <laughs> like the guy like is intensely staring at it and then he's just like he looks like charlie brown i don't know why kind of but like what is he wearing the whole thing where it's just like He's intently looking at this stone and he's like, I'm busy. I don't have time to tell you what this is. Oh, that looks like uh, Rodan. Yeah. You know, the dangerous demon from the sky. It's a pterodactyl. It's going to burn like, oh, your children Rodan. alive. No, that's a spaceship, you fucking twat. Yeah. Didn't I tell you my son was on that? He's wearing really thick gloves. Anyway. Well, yeah, because he was out with his cow getting rocks by the river. Yeah. He's, you know, his day job. <laughs> <laughs> he's there with Ryan Philippi dumpster diving basically <laughs> but anyway um and then we have the the local we're scanning for radio waves crew because like they yeah. don't react to this at all you think they'd be like what, yeah they come by the mystery machine yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh scooby-doo but you know what is interesting about this and that's we talked the, about that, this that's the greatest too. of the lost episodes of the spectator film podcast was scooby-doo maybe someday we'll maybe another that. day who knows yeah pay us fuckers <laughs> Support us uh, on Patreon and we'll rewatch the Scooby Doo. Pay us and we'll find Freddie Prince Jr. and we'll, we'll, we'll ask watch him to be on the every show. Every Scooby Doo movie in a row. Yeah. All of them. But yeah, the thing about that scene that is interesting, though, um, is that, again, it contributes to this future world vision, 1999. Yes. You know, fuck 2001, 1999, is Max. Where it's at. It's even before the two years before, Max. But anyway, in this future world, um, where we need huge white arrows to point the thing. <laughs> we uh, found a mind control device and a coconut. It was Whoa. right. It was that <laughs> coconut though. That one right there. Um, again, you still maintain this idea of balance, right? You, it's not a entirely metropolitan urban wasteland, right? Uh, you have cities and you have maintained this idea of rural Japan, where people still apparently make a living by collecting rocks with their cow. <laughs> As <laughs> one know. does. Is that a traditional Japanese? Not that I'm aware of. Jo I don't know. Um, so I don't know. Um, but anyway, the point is that it's not in a city and it has this feeling of like, you know, using a domesticated animal. It feels very rural. It feels I like out this of the past. little device, like that's basically a radio, but it's also <laughs> like a television on the radio. Yeah. And as soon as she hears her name, she's just like, oh, time to go. Yeah. This is one of the like weirdest moments for me because it's just the realization that we're watching her literally commit a terrorist attack is like shocking. And at first, like when I was rewatching this, I'm like, wait, what are they looking for? And if like they're looking for people, then like why are they letting her go? And then. It's just like, oh, they're looking for like a lump on her neck, but yeah. she has a different mind control thing. Cleverly, the movie doesn't try to point it out too much. Yeah. Yeah. But then she's just like, oh. Yep. But it is, it is really, that's probably the creepiest moment of this movie, just to know that 
yeah, it, it's She's not like similar a, to, it's not analogous to, it is literally just showing you a terrorist attack happen. Because yeah, well, she's acting as a beacon to draw the fucking monster yeah. there because they destroyed... caused this catastrophe. They destroyed all the mind control coconuts that they had around the world. But. Where'd you get the coconut? Well, it's a long story. Yeah. Uh, Monty Python. We should do one of those eventually. Sure. Although doing comedies is slightly hard. We'll um, do... Uh, uh, Live at the Hollywood Bowl. Monty Python, Live at the Hollywood Bowl. One of the movies that came out the same day as The Thing, Blade Runner, and most famously, Megaforce. Yeah. Starring Barry Bostwick. <laughs> Which every movie did better than Blade Runner and The Thing. Oh, uh, God. Especially Megaforce. Yes, Megaforce was the number one at the box office. <laughs> we mm-hmm. could, obviously. Absolutely. Over I guess the one thing we could say about the silly coconut thing is that I guess the the way to establish visually that the key locks have even superior, more superior technology is that their technology has reached a total synth- synthesis for like organic, natural kind matter. of, but then also they can just take the top off and you can see yeah, <laughs> the thing. The, like but I, they do have their base later and it's like the doors are literally like rocks that like evaporate. Yeah. And yeah. Then, until Godzilla accidentally exposes part of the base and then it looks like an Easter egg sticking out the side of the mountain. But that's besides the point. Hey, we have Godzilla and Rodan, two movies that are going to be in uh, the next Godzilla movie that's coming out. Two movies? What now? Huh? I said there's, those are two monsters that are going to be in the next Godzilla movie that's coming Perfect. out. We have, and actually, yeah, actually every monster that <gasps> Volkswagen. is going to be in the next Godzilla is in this film. We have Godzilla, we have Rodan. What about that fucking squirrel one? Do you remember this? <laughs> At the end? The one that's like, what when was that one? <laughs> What about Manda? Is Manda going to be in it? No. You liked that movie from last year. Anyway, moving on. Um, uh, but Nicolas Cage was in it. Remember? Boo. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, we have Godzilla. I'm going to make a Manda movie and put him in it just to fuck with you now. Just you wait. We have Godzilla, we have <laughs> Rodan, we have Mothra, and we have King Ghidorah all in this movie, which are arguably the most iconic ones. I've never understood why Rodan is that iconic, because he's always just been a pterodactyl. But and, and as we commented upon during the prep screening, he kind of has a stupid face. In the older movies, he looks bad. He gets better as like the movies go on, but yeah, like his head is too small for his body. And well, it's it not looks... just that. It's like he doesn't have... His snout does not protrude out it like angles down it looks like somebody really smacked him in the face with the shovel well it also looks like somebody's wearing a costume and they need to be able to see out of the <laughs> fucking front of it um, Ooh, yeah oh rest in peace yeah for all that you don't know the original godzilla suit actor died about a year and a half ago but he had a good run he did yeah. he was actually honored at the oscars i was surprised about that he wasn't in this one though it was andy circus all of them yeah uh, and then doug jones played that tank <laughs> Or that missile, because he's just no, a Doug, skinny. Jo- Doug Jones just plays every aquatic monster <laughs> they have. Whenever Godzilla's swimming. Whenever you need something that's skinny, or you need something, uh, you need a mime, uh, or, or you know, something that swims, you call Doug Jones, and he's got you covered. Yeah. I'd love to meet Doug Jones. Every interview and like thing I see with him, he just seems like the most genuinely nice, up, yeah, upbeat, wonderful person. I actually have a friend who met him at a convention thing, and apparently he gives hugs to everybody. I can imagine that. Yeah. Because I, I, I remember uh, we have a new Hellboy movie coming out, which I'm angry about. But uh, the uh, when because Ron Perlman loved being in those movies, people were asking him, it's just like, oh, uh, well, like, what's your condition if like you want to do Hellboy three? Is it's like, is there like a reason you wouldn't do it? And he's like, if I'm doing Hellboy three, Doug Jones has to be there with me because I have never met a more caring and nice person to work with. I'm just like, oh, sure, it's wonderful to hear. That was like the only time I was really happy at the Oscars is when Shape of Water somehow won Best Picture. But I was happy when they announced Best Director. I'll say yeah. that too. But here's a good question, right? I, you know what? I have to admit. I did, was not fully prepared because I have one. He, oh, I hate it when they take the anamorphic thing off. Put it back on. Why do you do this? It's going to do that really awfully later when it's like. Oh, when they're in space. Yeah, yeah and it does the flip. Why? God, Whoa. I always hate it when they do that. They Whoa. do that. Brian De Palma does that in Dress to Kill. I watched that again recently, and there's like a driving chase scene, and then it does that, and it's like, what the fuck am I looking at? <laughs> I hate it. I hate it when they do that. I'm sorry. Maybe Soap it looks better over. on the big screen back in the day. I don't know. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, I mean, I don't know. Maybe, I, I, 
audience. I'm done complaining about it. Yeah. But anyway, um, what was, oh, fuck, what was I saying? Oh, I was going to say, I had questions about how they did this, right? And specifically with, you know, the missiles and, like, bullets firing at them, where it looks like, like, tracer rounds or whatever. Yeah. Um, and it really does look like they're just shooting those off at them. And it really, it really makes you appreciate, like, the puppetry and just, not just the puppetry, but how they made those outfits and everything in the first place. Because it has to be, it has to interact in almost like a, on like a chemistry level with the really sharp, like hot, like flare things they're shooting in a very specific way so that it doesn't catch on fire, but still <laughs> looks like there's something combusting when it hits them, you know? Which they do very well. And honestly, this part, because we were talking about that fire is the hardest thing to fix with miniatures. You saw that in the beginning of this movie? Yeah. With like the ship taking off and you're like, oh, that's just like a little fire. And part. why? Because it does not scale. Yes, you cannot scale fire. No matter, like, you have to make a bigger set yeah. because, like, small fire looks like small fire. Water's and, uh, pretty difficult yeah. with that, too, but you can do some fun camera tricks and cuts to, like, other other footage to kind of make water look better, whereas fire is just yeah. going to look like They make fire. everything with the miniatures look good. I mean, we just passed that, like, vis- like vista of destruction. Yeah. You know? And it was like, it's, uh, it, like, I believe that Superman was there. <laughs> Zach I really Schneider, do. How could you do this to Japan? <laughs> what if Superman was just in this movie? What if it's just this movie, but it's Superman? There has been Godzilla versus Superman before, I know. No, I mean that. not even Superman. Like you know how the key locks like let the monsters loose. What yeah. if they just let Superman loose from Monster Island? <laughs> and everyone's like, "Fuck! Oh my god!" As as you say that, there has already been an alternate universe Superman comic written with that exact premise. Because there's alternate Superman universe comics for everything. Well, this movie also, as we can see from uh, this young man's outfit, ties into the Mario cinematic universe. Yes. like That has dinosaurs in it. A decade before Mario <laughs> was even a thing. They're really, really thinking ahead with this. Oh, I'm sorry. This takes place in the far distant future of 1999. So right. Mario had been out for a while. Mario had been a very successful fa- like franchise. Already, yes. Yeah. But no, I do like the Star Trek esque thing of just like yeah. very bright color outfits for everybody working in the science. It's mm-hmm. but it feels both Star Trek to me and in a slightly less connected way, kind of like James Bond ish, you know, but like the campier James Bond. Definitely, if you're gonna chart some sort of progression in the Godzilla Toho franchise, you start with the original like Gojira, right, and yeah. then you get to this point and. This feels so much more definitively 60s <laughs> than that one does. And it's it's trying to accomplish very different things. Also, what is... I know I brought this up yesterday, but what was the key locks plan here of let's send this woman to try to get the reporters to publish like our terms for surrender for them. Let's send her completely unescorted and with easily removable mind control devices attached yeah. to her. What what was the end goal here? I don't know. Come on, Keylock, you fucking weird space slugs who live in rocks. Come on, think your plans through. You more. needed to send somebody with a little bit more experience who is more committed to the cause. You need to send Kellyanne Conway. Yeah, send you, send one needed. send one of your sparkle dress people with you, a force field yeah, around. Yeah, you them. don't need to brain also What the fuck? <laughs> That's like also just a weirdly tonally like oblivious moment where he just like fucking assaults this woman yeah who is she his the girlfriend love or interest yeah sister she's her certainly not his mother they're connected somehow we saw them call each other yeah i can't tell if they're like siblings or like engaged or whatever the fuck is going on lovers uh, yeah there's something they just called each other for some reason yeah and then he feels it's okay to just like fucking rip her earrings off her <laughs> off her ears to the point where it's like it's making her bleed horribly profusely yes <laughs> but also i feel like this is maybe one of the stumbling blocks of the movie for me where okay obviously this movie has certain goals right but i do think it is genuinely engaging with this idea of like this invasive system trying to you know sabotage the, a system that's working in japan right and I feel like it's kind of a cop out to have the indoctrinated members just be like, I have no memory. Cause then it makes it really easy to be like, Oh, they're all good. Yeah. You know, 
I know this movie has certain interests and certain priorities in how long it is. It's 90 minutes flat. I like that. Yes. But if you wanted to make it a little bit more intelligent and sophisticated, you wouldn't necessarily have the, you know, the brainwashing thing because then it forces you to deal with the sort of uh, moral ambiguity of identifying with your you know, oppressors. Yeah. Or just some sort of force that is looking to oppress people. So yeah, that's interesting. And well, also on the, uh, we have one of my favorite, as far as miniature scenes go, this is one of my favorite. Little yeah. Bits just in the, the military stuff, a military parade. And then like, not even parade, but like them all going out to one it's kind of a parade. Kind of. That's a like, good way to describe every sort of miniature scene in this is sh- it's shot like a parade. Kind of. Yeah. I enjoy about it. I just always love how they like, but all the movies, these Godzilla Kaiju movies have scenes like this. And you just know every time it's just hilarious. The contrast between how much they're hyping it up and how useless it's going to be in approximately like 12 seconds. But look at that. I love that. Oh, I the lo- like the optical printing they're doing. The optical printing of it's like kind of fucking amazing. I see no matte lines around them at all. Yeah. Like you can tell what they're doing, but like it's like 10 years before star Wars mm-hmm. and they could get away with it cause they were in space and, it didn't matter if you saw black outlines on, on around the shit. Yeah, that looks really good. And yeah, it, it's pretty it looked, amazing. It was a like pretty clean cut from just like miniature footage to like oh the people coming out look this, look at this and that like it wasn't necessary for them to do that, but it was sort of just like oh yeah. look at this, look how real this is. They definitely you know this camera the camera is definitely way more fascinated with the miniatures and getting that right, you know, and. Uh, it makes sense to me that they would put effort into that, even though it's in on a pure basis of like decoupage and like choosing your shots. It doesn't necessarily contribute anything, but it sells the miniature miniatures more. <laughs> oh, this is my favorite line in the movie. Are you ready? Cut rockets. Emergency. Or does he say it not here? Say yeah. it with me. Oh, no, he said it already. You missed it. Sorry. Fuck, I missed it. God damn it, Austin. God damn it. The computer is just in the way of the subtitles for me. That well, we need Shit. to. We need to just end the podcast. Oh, we've got to. I'm just gonna go walk into the ocean now. Yeah, in high heels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, like like the woman on the beach. Have you ever tried walking in high heels before? It's fucking murder. Um, but anyway, now we get to the military shooting shit at Godzilla, and it's not going to do anything because it never does in these movies. I here. don't know why you think you can just say that and like talk about other things immediately after. We Sorry. don't have to talk about it more now, but we're definitely going to hit a movie at some point. We're going to explain on air why you have at some point worn high heels. Oh, because I uh, was cosplaying a character who's a crossdresser. Okay. How did that go? Um, I was wearing my girlfriend at the time's heels, and she had significantly smaller feet than me. My feet were bleeding by the end of the day. But other than that, I had a grand old time. <laughs> Austin is very baffled by that. Um... I mean, it makes complete sense. Oh, look at Godzilla, though. And they've made Godzilla look more and more badass over the years, but like... He doesn't need no high heels. Just step right on that tank. Godzilla would look great with high heels. Um, actually... <laughs> Girlzilla? Is that, that was, what you're saying? That was... Uh, high heels don't have to be gendered. But that was actually one of the complaints that the Japanese had about the 2014 American Godzilla, is we made him too fat. Okay. He was too chubby. So okay. you can tell that in Shin Godzilla because like they made him like a much slimmer design. It is interesting how in the more recent American Godzilla movies, it's sort of like the ones that originate from America. Yeah. Right? And I wouldn't even say the 2014 one is a quote unquote real Godzilla movie. You know? They didn't hate it, it, it kind as... It exists on, on yeah. its own. The, Jap- the Japanese didn't have the kind of visceral reaction they did to Godzilla 1998, where there was... Well, like, that's fucking justified. Yeah. I mean, that's not a matter of, like, cultural difference that's like, wow, this is just awful. You took this You can thing. watch that if, if you're from any country on the planet and be like, <laughs> what the fuck is it's this? It's honestly the most unifying of all the Godzilla movies, because everybody from every nationality... That's a lot of fish. Yeah, can come together and just be like, holy shit, this is terrible. Yeah. I can't think of a single redeeming thing about that movie, but that's besides the point. Did I tell you I once acted in a movie with Matthew Broderick? No, you haven't. Well, I'll save that mo- that story for when we do that movie on the podcast. <laughs> no, we can't do that. There's a reason those episodes are lost for a reason, because one day we thought... Oh, no, not Godzilla, the movie I was in with him. Oh, God. This is not a joke. This is not a joke. I believe you, but this is more interesting than like why I've worn high heels and you can't just keep this from me now. Well, I'm sorry. 
I, I told you exactly what I'm going to do, and we're going to have to save it. Thing is, I know there's an instant instance at the some point in the future where we can do that movie on the show. Okay, and it'll be great, well, and I'll point out where I am. I love how we've like dr- name dropped eighty movies that were said we're going to do in the future, <laughs> and we'll get around to doing and, exactly and Matthew Broderick. Are you guys impressed? Huh, Matthew huh? Broderick. Matthew Broderick. Ferris Bueller two coming to a theater near you. Ferris Tuller. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they do that soon. F. Tourist Bueller. Except who's like, I don't, I don't know. I don't keep up with the young actors. Who's like a cool young guy that you would get to play Ferris Bueller? Ansel Elgort. <laughs> what? <laughs> that actor. Ansel Elgort? <laughs> yeah. He's a hip, cool young guy, Max. Don't you know this? No, I don't. Oh, I'm sorry. I was mistaking that with what the studios want me to think. What is he in? Who are you talking about? That name sounds made up. It's interesting you say that because he's one of those very bland white young men that seems like, who's the Han Solo guy? Oh, that guy. Well, it's not him, but does it matter? It, like, they like they seem like they were come from like some sort of test tube somewhere. It's like that poor kid who like is typecast as the person that you cover up their eyes. Um, the... He's another one, but it's like... <laughs> Do, would it matter if you saw his eyes? No, it wouldn't. No, he doesn't. Because can you tell the difference? No. He, he kind of looks weird without shit covering the top of his face, <laughs> which I feel bad for saying. Maybe but. in the Lord of the Rings Amazon TV show, he can be the mouth of Sauron oh, that comes God. out and talks, I don't fuck your mother, or whatever the fuck he says. Oh my, I love that. That actor is like really moving, like working his You know head. who that is? Who? Bruce Spence. Really? It's the snake man from Road Warrior. That's the snake guy. That makes a lot of sense. That Does book. it? That's like so random and weird. No, but like in terms of like corny overacting, because like the, <sighs> the mouth of Sauron was cut from the final release of that movie. Because but it is a fun scene on its own. It is wonderful. Yeah. And in terms of set, de- like or costume design, he's a lot of fun. So, <laughs> but yeah, like in terms of overacting and silliness, I can totally see that being Bruce Spence. Like I, if people wanted to level a complaint against those movies, you might be able to say that not all of the, um, you know, the big bad is Sauron, but you have tiers of like minion bad guys. Yeah. And not all of those are created equally. <laughs> those minion bad guys, right? No. Some are more interesting than the rest. But he is a standout as like just a mid tier like bad guy because he's just got this weird, quirky personality. <laughs> well, like he's not like he doesn't have like evil powers. He's not like he just like an army of he's orcs. A troll. He's he just comes out is. to insult Aragorn and call him yeah, a bitch and then gets his head chopped, chopped up. <laughs> we fucking killed these people. You have no fucking idea. You are fucked, buddy. You're fucked. That's okay. what he sounds like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was a very good verbatim thing. I, I, my mind started going to like. Al Pacino's like Glen Gary, Glenn Ross <laughs> yelling at Kevin Spacey. Where'd, we, you, where'd you learn your fucking trade? We should all be yelling at Kevin Spacey. Yeah. Oh no, rocks. Right. We're still watching Godzilla destroy all monsters. I oh, this is that. the part where they go find the key locks. Yeah. Is this a good time to talk about, um, just the Kaiju film as a genre? Sure. Because I think it's very easy to look at it in, uh, you know what? We're going to arrive at a universal understanding of all genres right here, right? Yes, obviously. Ultimately, you cannot come up with a unifying theory for any given genre. Why? Because in order to do so, you would have to see every film in it and figure out the similarities for the ingredient that makes it this versus that. And you would also have to see like every movie in existence. To yes. Be, it's just like, oh. It's the empiricist dilemma. Yeah. So it's impossible to do. And even if you had done that, the thing is you would have to come up with a unifying sort of ingredient that makes it belong to one genre or another. Right. And it becomes this question of, well, then if somebody disagrees with you about what that ingredient is or whether or not it's present in the movie, then you're at a total impasse. There's nothing you can do. Well, that's true outside of yeah. film too. Like for everything. Yeah. Like for music and right. whatnot, you're just like, Oh, I like this genre. It's just like, Oh, well that's not really this. Like, right. Oh my God. As a fan of punk music, it's just like, all oh, that's not real punk. And you have this and mm-hmm. that, and you have the term pop punk. And then just like, now you have people being like, Oh, that's not real pop punk. I'm just like, what world am I living in? Just enjoy music. Yes. So at a certain point when you're talking about movies like this within that framework, it becomes difficult for people to place them because is this a sci-fi movie? Is this, a horror movie. Is this a weird fantasy movie? These are fantasy monsters. You know what I mean? 
and you can well, make he mentions in the book that things. yeah he, may, he mentions in the book that like an early inspiration for them was yeah the japanese myth of yokai which is the most fucking broad termed thing because there's a yokai for everything every like weird um, yeah you can do have the same fucking conversation i'm sure there's people like cultural anthropologists or just historians japanese historians who just enjoy learning about yokai but i'm sure they yeah. categorize them to different things but you can have this conversation about literally anything so yes. it becomes hard to actually set clear limits on something that said i think we can probably make certain strides towards defining the difference between a kaiju movie and other types of monster movies. It's not quite a horror movie. Um, I think it's adjacent to that. I think it's also adjacent to sci-fi. Um, but I think it is, it has reached a point where it seems definitively enough its own tradition. Well, I think that you can identify certain similar elements. He also mentions like, cause there was uh, what was it? The British movie that Gorgo yeah Gorgo which is like he differentiates from Japanese kaiju films because that's more of like a, it, it was like a weird mixture of like the Japanese monster movies and at the same time like King Kong which like right if we're defining kaiju movies as just like giant monsters then okay America had fucking King Kong way before this and we've had King Kong versus Godzilla but well in in the conclusions I arrived at about what might define a kaiju movie I think King Kong falls into that tradition. It's just, it's one instance in America in 1933, and it doesn't go in a direction after that. There's like certain movies that are similar to it, but there's not, the, I think the key ingredient here, if we're going to sort of identify certain things, are, okay, how does the movie consider its monster is the most important thing, and how are we supposed to relate to the monster as an audience? Right. One of the things we skipped over interesting moments that are present in a lot of these movies is scenes where characters watch monsters fight each other or destroy things on a television screen. Right. They in those moments become they, they play the role of the audience is what happens. Right. Oh, uh, we missed the greatest line in the movie, by the way. Fuck. <laughs> God damn it. Where they're talking about how they're going to land on a swamp. Rewind your VCR and go look at that. Because yeah. seriously, we got to check that out. Did they use the word swamp? Did you see it? No, I didn't. But we, Damn it. We missed the section. No, there. I think they're going to say it still. Hold on. I'm going to keep talking, but Very... if, we, if we see swamp, we're going to bring it up. Right on target. Very near no. Alpine Valley. Okay, sure. so and Crater. I think that was probably just mm. a mistranslation in the subtitles that we had yesterday. Well, then you know what? I've got to go back and fucking change it. Because it's got to be swamp. <laughs> Approach from the left side. All right. Well, we'll keep an eye out for this. A massive vapor. That's probably what it was. Okay. Alpine Ridge. Is that what translated to swamp in the other dub? Oh, no. What the fuck? There's, there it is. <laughs> Nor the swamp. So I don't know. There's, don't know there's an Alpine Ridge, which makes me think of fucking trees. And then there's a swamp. So I don't know. Is this our moon or a different moon? Who knows? Anyway. What was I saying? Oh, I guess if you're going to identify key factors in what would make a, a kaiju movie versus other large monster movies is this idea of how we as an audience are supposed to relate to the monster and the movie's opinion of the monster and how it sort of regards them. Uh, we get those scenes, like I said, where the characters in the film are relegated to a position of being an audience and they start to comment upon or... Um, sort of almost narrate the events they're seeing on the screen when the monsters are interacting, right? And I think that's a very important moment and scene to use in any one of these movies to help identify the movie's like attitude towards the monsters in that moment. And I think the key thing in these kaiju movies is um, that it does have this feeling of being kind of more a sense of identification after a certain point with the monsters and the monsters being very much their own entity. Like, we can speculate on the monsters being like, okay, it's a representation in the first Godzilla movie of the outcome of the nuclear blast and them picking up the pieces. Yeah. It's very deliberate, and it's not subtle. Um, and it's viscerally depicted, right? But the thing is, there's this element in that movie where it focuses on establishing the idea that Godzilla has its own identity too. It's not merely an allegory or a symbol or something that stands in for another thing. And that also is an, a testament to the power of what it's relating to in the real world where it's like, no, it takes on a life of its own and it lives. It has its own 
force and power and you can't neatly put it into a box because it is uncontrollable, right? So I think the idea of having these monsters is neat because it doesn't allow you to sort of, um, I guess, pin them down in terms of how you feel about them entirely. It's always going to be somewhat ambiguous because you can't even just somebody analyzing the movie, right? You can't relate them one-to-one to some sort of outside scenario. They always have their own agency and interiority that you will never grasp fully. There's that, yeah. And he that points, allows them to come back around and be good sometimes. Yeah, he points that out where there's... Because you have the early on one, which is an obvious metaphor. And then you have the later on ones that also have it. But you can't just be like, oh... It's Mothra. Mothra represents this. So that's yes. what yeah. she's going to be doing in this movie because the meaning behind each kaiju changes for it. Like Mecha Godzilla, the most recent uh, version of him, Kiryu, is a good example of that where that movie, the Tokyo SOS, where he was reintroduced into the modern Godzilla movies, they for whatever inexplicable reason in the movie, they built Mecha Godzilla around the skeleton of the original Godzilla because that's what you do. And it kept having flashbacks to when it was actually alive and like acting out and started destroying Japan, which if you look at the time the movie was made, 2003, we were trying to pressure Japan to rearm themselves and join us in a war in the Middle East. Right. So you can interpret which was mechagodzilla which was originally a good guy and like japan's savior against godzilla which was probably at the time like oh look at we the self-defense force is a good thing that's great we have this but then you have a time where it's like maybe we shouldn't further remilitarize japan because context sensitive yeah it's going to gonna bring back memories of world war ii era japan and look how lot look what we did last time we had yeah. such an expansive military and you know what this is just a hypothesis I'm forming now. Yes. But I'm going to also go out on a limb and say, maybe you could vaguely compare the way Kaiju operate to, um, very vaguely the idea of like the Hegelian conception of tragedy, wherein in, in the Hegelian sort of analysis of how <laughs> tragedy works. A wonderful death scene. Yeah. I love these where they turn into tinkler slugs. Yes. Hashtag tinkler cinematic universe. Make it happen. People. Jason Blum, get on it. Um, anyway, what was that? Oh, he's too busy making uh, <laughs> excuse, Truth or Dare three. Excuse me, I was talking about Hegel. Pardon me. Oh. Anyway, um, oh, Keebler elves. Got so many interesting things in this movie. But uh, yeah, Hegel. So his understanding of tragedy is you have the hero and an institution, right? And tragedy happens when these two things come into conflict with one another. And why does that happen? Because they either one of these things comes to identify themselves so completely and commit themselves so fully to some sort of like moral principle or like, like moral substance. And they identify it to the point of, uh, excluding the other possibility. And a key fact of this is that both sort of moral things that exist in contrast to one another and in opposition in the context are justified, right? But if you believe in it too much, if you commit to it too much to the point where it is at the exclusion of any other perspective, you are taking a justified position and going too far. And the tragedy can only resolve itself when the the tragic hero fails and it absolves them of their principle, right? Um, So that's sort of an understanding of how it works in a very general sense. But I think it relates to the kaiju because they seem to just be behaving like animals frequently they we can use them as representations and like metaphors of you know countries you know being malicious and attacking one another and the mayhem that causes but within the movies themselves they always seem to operate along like sort of animal instincts right a lot of the times like you'll have monsters like in the later movies and even some of the earlier ones like mothra is the like one of the ones that seems to be acting like in form of a higher intelligence, like trying sure. to accomplish a goal or whatnot yes. outside of animal instincts. But yeah, for the most part, you have like their wild, uncontrollable forces, yeah. and animals that well, they have their own internal instincts, yes. which is what you're saying. And I mean, okay, you were talking about Kiryu. That's how it's yeah. said, right. Even that one is like it's it's becomes hard to vilify it in a certain sense because it's usually this unintended consequence of like 
people doing something fucking bad. Yeah. Right. So, and then when the animal is put in that situation, it's just going to behave the way it's going to behave. You know what I mean? It's like when you see idiot tourists try to like get close to some animal where it's like, don't get close to that animal Mm -hmm. and then like kicks them or something. It's like, well, what did you think was going to happen? I thought it would be nice. Like in the cartoons, (laughs) I thought it would be nice to get close to this kangaroo until it broke my (laughs) rib cage, (laughs) kicked me back to the U S uh, we're going to see gore source. That's the the reason why, uh, like hippos are the most dangerous animal in Africa. It's because people are just like, oh, hippos, they're big, fat, yeah. and cute. It's like, no, they have a like mouth span of like over four feet wide and could crush you like without exerting even a tenth of the effort that they could. I mean, even if they didn't kill the most people, I feel like you'd have to look at them and be like, they're the most dangerous. Yeah. Right? But like... They do kill the most people, though. Outside of mosquitoes. Right. But that doesn't really count. But yeah, it's exactly that thing where it's like you know, it's hard to vilify them because they have their own internal motivation. And I think that's a key difference in identifying a kaiju monster from just another, like, horror movie monster. Like, okay, you you mentioned that paper you wrote on them versus Godzilla. Godzilla is a kaiju monster, but I don't feel like the giant ants and them are kaiju monsters. No, they're not. I I pointed that out where the, the giant ants and them, they are... By definition, mindless drones. They are just like, oh, we're going to go get sugar. We're going to go do this. But they don't really have an overt goal. They're just sort of a menace that now exists in this atomic age and that we have to put under control. Whereas Godzilla, it's just like, no, it's like an uncontrollable monster that like has a vision of its own and is going yeah. to keep going forward. And, and it, Well, if you look at the way any animal behaves in a giant animal monster movie, right, they're going to ontologically it would be like, oh, of course it has its own goals. But in terms of how the movie depicts it, yes. like in them, it's like they're malicious, they're evil. Yeah. It's okay taking that position. Whereas in Godzilla, it's always forces you to a certain level of ambiguity about that because it never, one of the core concepts of like these types of movies is like humanity playing a role and having some sort of responsibility for what's going on. You can never distance yourself entirely from the destruction that, the animals are well causing. even in like even in the movies where Godzilla is the most vilified and he's like the evil destructive force like yeah whenever he dies at like the end of the movie you f- like you feel bad for it like, right because it has like it has and a lot of the movies do this where like they'll play sad music as it like slowly sure. dies and whatnot and the movie makes you feel just like hey you may have won but like you killed the <laughs> this thing don't you right. not, like, and you're off the hook of that yeah it has it's not just a sense of fear of what's going on. It's like a weird type of awe of it. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, and then at the end, like of them, it's just like, Oh, well we found the major ant nest. Let's yeah. light it on fire and we'll move along with our day because and we're the you, American military. You can find a ton of giant monster animal movies yeah. from around that time and then compare them and see which one is more kaiju and which one is more just atomic era monster movie. I mean, something like, uh, the beast from, uh, 20,000, 20,000 fathoms or whatever. 20,000 leagues, yeah. Or whatever it is. Like, that's just a monster movie. There yeah. are plenty of monster movies like that. But then if you go look at something like from 1949, Mighty Joe Young, <laughs> that's more of a kaiju movie. <laughs> Kinda, yeah. Like, I'm sorry, I forgot that movie existed. That movie actually has really amazing uh, stop motion. It does. Like That, that was a Harry Hazlitt yeah. adventure, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's some really good set pieces with uh, mighty Joe <laughs> in, in that movie. I, that movie is pretty solid for the stop motion, but again, that's, there's more of a personification going on there. Cause there's an understanding and appreciation of the monster as its own individual entity, which, you know, I, I don't think is present in comparable movies that are just monster movies. So it's interesting. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What are they trying to do here? Something's being lit on fire. The, that, I believe that's the mind control beacon that they have on the moon. So that like they're trying to saw it off with this laser to take it home. But like it, the amount of force that it's like exerting is like almost yeah, short circuiting their laser. Oh, okay. But that was the tension that was in the scene. But they did it. Don't worry. We're fine. Until we find our third pajillion base where they're now controlling the monsters. I'm glad they all wore matching outfits. Yeah, it's very nice. 
they look like they're from some sort of like progressive commercial. <laughs> it looks exactly the same. Progressive commercials are just fucking weird now. I mean, they've always been weird, but it's like, <laughs> are you going to bring up a new commercial? No. I don't want to talk about commercials, Max. No. I'm sorry. <laughs> I wasn't. I, I just had a flashback to, do you remember, do you remember e-surance? You are talking about a commercial. Yeah, I know. But uh, <laughs> I was more talking about how they had to cancel those commercials because uh, there was too much porn of the cartoon lady that was the mascot of insurance online. So people like couldn't sh- yeah, search insurance without getting associated with that. Good times. Thanks, Internet. Did I ever show you that one uh, Kleenex commercial, that Japanese Kleenex commercial, which I, uh, I, I like looking up these videos online with my coworkers. Um <laughs> Where, uh, okay, so for anybody who doesn't know, I work in production stuff. So when you see these videos online that are like the top five cursed whatever videos on YouTube, and you see it's just like some fucking stupid video with like an After Effects filter, it's just hilarious to see all these people. It's cursed, fucked with my computer. And then it's just some weird thing. Um, And the Kleenex commercial is like one of those where somebody apparently you, it changes when you watch it at midnight, right? So they watch it. It's very creepy and weird on its own, I've got to say. But then they watch it at midnight in this other YouTube video. And it like slows down and pitch shifts. And then they start experiencing packet loss in the video. But it's not packet loss because it's still playing. It's just they literally simulated that and just made a fake video. Boo. So it just it just looks like packet loss is the creepy curse that's going to happen to you. <laughs> In the weird Kleenex video. It's oh, like, God, uh, it's hilarious. My uh, ex girlfriend used to love watching the show uh, BuzzFeed uh, Unsolved or whatever it was, where like they have, they go to like, I think there's a true crime version of it too, but they also go to like, they go to quote unquote haunted places. Okay. And they have one guy who like 100% believes in this ghost shit. And then one guy is just like, what the fuck are you talking about? This is all bullshit. One of us. Yeah, so it's hilarious because of that. So they go to this like one house and they have like a ghost hunters type guy there. And he's just like, "Oh, do you do you hear that knocking? That's the Trinity." And he's just like the other guys, like, uh, "Are you sure you're not just knocking your foot against the chair right there?" And it's, oh, good times. Don't trust anything you see because people will act surprised and try to fuck with you because trying to convince you that it's real will make you yeah get more content than just constantly being like, uh, "No, it's 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 fake." That's a, it's easy to prey on people's like yeah. willingness to believe. Oh, can we interrupt for this moment where this guy who's talking with the microphone is the narrator from the beginning of the movie? Yeah, he's been narrating. And suddenly him. he's in the movie. <laughs> well, we did see him earlier on, like behind a news desk, but now he's like out in the field. Dad, dad, <laughs> you've got to come help me fight. Godzilla says I need to learn how to fight, fight my, my own, own battles. battles. <laughs> Exactly. Wasn't that movie like entirely a dream too? Like the kid got knocked out by a bully and then I think like, he gets knocked out and it's basically like his concussion nightmare. Yeah. Is that he got the shit beaten out of him. Ooh. The our leading lady was dressed like uh, Jackie Kennedy there. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Manda, Baragon, Gorosaurus, and Spiga. There's <gasps> what okay, what is that flying fucking squirrel it's, thing? It's Gorosaurus. No, it's not. Yeah, it is. No, Gorosaurus is the like B team Godzilla T Rex. Um, you see some other ones too that don't appear in this. Yeah, there's no. Also, like, really, you couldn't have fucking Mothra like level up into a moth. Yeah, I why? Think, Was I the think, outfit broken? I think it might just because like that takes away Rodan's one unique trait in this movie. Yeah, I guess so. He's got the shockwave thing though. Yeah, yeah, well, they don't want to have him breathe in fire, apparently, and also, I like, but then at the same time, like, by having Mothra, like, just be a caterpillar that can shoot web, you have her, like, step on the spider's territory. Yeah, here we go, Max. Oh, you're, they're watching uh, Godzilla versus the Astro Monster. Yeah. Oh, wait, never mind. <laughs> it's King Ghidorah. He's here. Before we witness this amazing jamboree we're about <laughs> to watch, um, we'll just pay one last note towards uh, the analysis of the key locks as this type of invasive force, okay. right? Where obviously you can read it as symbolic that their base is hidden deep within Mount Fuji, uh, within Mount Fuji itself. That's where they exist, and you have to drive them out of Mount Fuji. Very, very easy to see some sort of symbolism there. Although, again, I think the movie, it lets people off the hook because it doesn't. it's easy for them to vilify the key locks, right? 
And um, differently, it's easy to vilify Ghidorah in this situation, even though you kind of feel sympathy despite, I think, the movie's <laughs> intentions because yeah. it just gets fucked up immediately. But I guess the point I'm making is that, okay, Japanese capitalism, right, is made in American capitalism's image, but this movie doesn't seem to acknowledge the possibility for Japanese capitalism to be equally exploitative or evil. No. Right? And we have that shown with the Keylock's yeah. signature monster, King Ghidorah, being very distinct from everything else in this Just movie. Just like the Keylocks themselves. Yes. They look like people, but they're othered in yes. this very specific way. And that's very easy for vilifying certain negative things. But it's like, it's not quite as simple if you're investigating the real reality of the situation. And anyway, back to the whole like premise of, like the whole purpose of this movie is to have every fucking monster in their repertoire just fight battle and yeah. then have godzilla boy <laughs> god i hate the close-up of rodan don't ever show his face yeah but you have a little he does actually look pr for the first time ever like rodan looks pretty interesting in the new movie i'm i'm actually surprised this but... is the oh god this sequence makes me so uncomfortable it it, it does just look godzilla questionable. look standing behind kadira or it's like it looks questionable. We'll say that. It, oh, it just looks like he's fucking him. I just can't deal with that. And I, I brought <laughs> I brought up in the movie before this with uh, Godzilla versus King Ghidorah, <laughs> Godzilla versus the Astro Monster, whatever you want to call it. Um, it only took Rodan and Godzilla to beat King Ghidorah in that movie. So, so like, now it's just you feel like awful. Yeah, you're just like, oh god damn it, leave him yeah. alone. Yeah, and. Uh, we were talking about this in terms of just what our favorite monsters were. Yeah. I think we, I mostly was drawing from my memory of like the video games, but we have a few that aren't in these, this movie. Yeah. They weren't in this area, but yet. most of them are just the ones you'd expect. Cause they just look amazing. They're amazing designs and they're fun. Right? Yeah. From costume design standpoints, I agree with you on a lot of them, yeah. but, and I think uh Ghidorah is interesting because it's like, it works if you wanted to have a story where you have a simple, you know, black, black hat, white hat sort of situation. Um, or this bright, sparkly, colorful monster. Yeah, which is very clearly from space. It doesn't yeah. look like a real animal. Yes, you know? it's it's distinctly different from all of these like brownish, gray, green, like actual reptile yeah, looking things. Yeah, which would look much more sort of at home in this. They don't look earth-like but they look like they belong to an environment yeah they look like thought out creatures whereas Ghidorah is an abstract monster like straight out of mythology yeah because you know? like it doesn't have arms like you're you're like how does this thing evolve on earth yeah. like what what no and also it's just like that's also why it works well in other instances as a type of representation of national spirit or something because it's a very abstract looking monster you know yeah there's a lot of stuff you can do with that no, but uh, if we're getting into specifics for for any kaiju fans at home wondering what what some of our favorite monsters are, um, if I had to choose, I'd probably I, I'm a big Mothra fan. I think Mothra is great, even though Mothra in like literally every movie she's in, besides her own movies, ends up sacrificing herself so Godzilla or the, whatever good monster can win. Which really you're gonna have the lady sacrifice herself and everything so the yeah. man can do? Come on, it's <laughs> annoying. I'm hoping she Mothra will get her due. Yes. Sure. Well, she got her own series. So, okay. Good, good. for her. Um, I think, what was the name of the one I mentioned? Uh, I wear, you like Megalon and uh, Gigan, I believe. Uh, well, they're both cool. I think the one that I, I res Oh, there's the kangaroo jump. Yeah. I love that. Um, Oh God. Ghidorah. Or Ghidorah. Fucked up. <laughs> Look at him. You don't feel triumphant here. You're just like, okay, you guys beat him. Just yeah. let him go. Let him stop it. But I mean, I think Megalon, Gigan, Ghidorah, Godzilla, Oh, you, uh, you brought up uh, Orga from Well, that was Godzilla what 2000. I was going to say. You have your A-team, right? Yeah. And then those are sort of like go-tos in terms of like, oh, that one's the coolest. Yeah. But in terms of one that like really had an impact on me, I thought um, Orga was like really, it was creepy. Orga was creepy because they evolved a lot. Yeah. And they really did a good job in that movie of establishing Orga as like this weird, almost like a parasite like it just consumes shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it can continue evolving. Oh, and then and it does the, like the weird the best vampire fighting thing. move ever of b blowing your vape cloud around Ghidorah's neck. Yeah. Oh, and they finally, they've finally done it. They kicked the shit out of this magical <laughs> space dragon. 
There's only one of those guys. <laughs> and then the spider and moth were just like are shooting confetti. Yeah, just for good measure. They're just like, yay, we did it. <laughs> yay. <laughs> we can keep using these shots over and over again. The other monster um, that I remember from Godzilla is the the bad guy from Re- Godzilla's Revenge, which I guarantee people must hate. But he has like a weird like oh the mohawk one. Is it a mohawk or, or is it like the it weird yellow like, tuft of hair? Yeah, it looks like a perm. They never brought. They never even mentioned that monster again. It, like he doesn't even come back in Godzilla. Who the fuck is that one? Nobody knows. Um, yeah. <laughs> Even in Godzilla Final Wars. Like, I didn't like him, though. I, I mean... Which is notorious silly. for bringing, like, everything back. Rodan's on fire! Oh, yeah. And then we have the, the Mighty Fire Dragon. Which, which that doesn't count. That's no, a monster. that's not a monster. It's a UFO going very fast. Um, yeah. But I can't remember because that thing never came back because everybody... Nobody wants to remember Godzilla's Revenge. Of course, that means we have to do it on the show now. Oh, my God. Is it... Zilla. Is it Gabara? I that... don't know. Yeah, that's what it is. Gabara. Look how fucking stupid he looks. He's kind of got like a unicorn horn. Yeah. And like a weird perm. He looks like a Chucky doll, almost. He looks very bad. It was definitely a bad idea. Oh, God. Well, he was, like, meant to, like, sort of resemble, the, I think, the bully that was building the kid. <laughs> really? So it, does the bully have the same hair? I think. I don't know. I haven't. Uh, you've probably seen Godzilla's Revenge more recently than I have, honestly. Um, so, like, 20 years ago or whatever? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was just a fun thing to point out about this part of the movie is uh, I'm sure it was fun to blow up the set, but I think they went a little bit overboard because now I wonder why the key locks didn't just do that. I mean, they just turned that into like hell instantly. In fact, we were pointing this out in the previous screening, but they blew it up so bad that like the chroma started changing. Yeah. And it just started turning to like magenta and then to yellow and then blue. It started it's affecting the color of the, <laughs> of the whole film. Not the, terrib- Not the fil- just the world, Max. Yeah. Oh no, not the fire dragon. Come on, lady. You just said that Godzilla or King Ghidorah was a space monster, so there was no reason that they could ever beat it. And then they just kicked the shit out of it. You really don't think that they'll be able to stop a very fast-moving UFO? To be fair, to just fuck up that island. I don't know what the point was of the machine she was talking about or whatever. I don't know. (laughs) I don't know anymore, folks. But Godzilla's sure going to breathe on it. And why didn't they just, like, leave the monsters contained on Monster Island and then, like, send Ghidorah to fuck up the world? I don't know. Whatever. I mean, it has to be what it is. It is. But again. I'm questioning the key locks plan immensely. I think the key lock plan makes more sense if you're looking at it in terms of that second order logic of maybe this movie making a vague stab at saying something about the current yeah. climate. Because that makes more sense as a sort of representation of a country sort of stirring shit up somewhere else, you know, Yeah. without even doing anything. It's not even like they're sending out their own monster. They're just like fucking with the ones you have for no reason to try to make it seem like you fucked up, yes. you know, because if it's, if it sends a new monster, then it's just like, well, this is just a new monster to deal with. If it appears like you're having a fucking problem containing the monsters you have, then you're doing the thing where it's creating a need for something. True. Right? If you want to read it that way, then yes. Yeah, that's what I'd say. Oh, I'm becoming a slug. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, God. Oh, everybody's going to be slugs tonight. Boop, boop, boo. Time to go in our slug rocks. What the fuck are you talking about? I don't know. What is that? Is that a song? <laughs> yes, it's everybody's going to be slugs tonight. I thought you were singing like everybody's going to wang chung tonight. <laughs> I started off that, but I'm just like, okay. Nah. Which is also another kaiju, right? Yes, Wang Chung. I'm trying to think of other kaiju movies, and I can really mostly think of Gorgo, Mighty Joe Young. I mean, King I, Kong. I brought up Gamera, obviously. Um, Gamera, yeah. the knockoff Godzilla franchise that is wonderful. Through sheer weirdness, yeah, <laughs> just validated itself. And then, yeah. like the early, like the early two thousand Gamera movies are like actually good. They're like a lot of fun to watch. I was like really surprised, um, but no, most of them are like 
they're goofier than like the weird Godzilla movies and endearing. And a lot of that has to do with mystery Ooh, science fuck. theater. We left out maybe one of my favorite kaiju. Really? Jet Jaguar. Jet of course. Jaguar. Because Jet Jaguar. God, I just love that theme song so yeah. much. Punch, punch, punch. Oh my God. Yeah, but Godzilla vs. Megalon is arguably one of the worst Godzilla movies, but by golly. In a certain sense, sure. Yeah. But by golly, if it doesn't have a lot of fun things in it, Jet Jaguar has never been brought back, and that is a really darn shame. He's iconic. Do you think people confuse him with Power Rangers? Is that the problem? Well, there's a lot of uh, Super Sentai yeah, things in Japan, so like you think uh, that makes sense, yeah. And some Ultraman stuff, so like you think that they would try to capitalize on. That's why they did it. Also, Jet yeah, Jack- Japan really does have a lot of like people in suit things, yeah, like that. Uh, Power Rangers are Japanese, yeah. But uh, <laughs> the reason Jet Jaguar looks like that is they had a contest to have you design a monster Godzilla would fight. <gasps> was it designed by like a kindergartner? Yeah, it was that's kind by, like, of a amazing. Five-year-old. Um, that's kind of amazing. We brought yeah. back Robert Rodriguez. Yeah, right, because he had his kids write those movies. That's why they're like that. Oh God! Whoa! Oh God! Please don't do this. You're having Whoa. all these amazing maneuvers with this awesome prop, and then it's just like, Whoa! <laughs> why did you do that? <laughs> you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and not say Ish- Ishiro Honda did that. I'm going to say it was AIP. They're oh. like, you know what would really help here is if we just fucked up this movie. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> Ishiro Honda, um, talk about like academic sort of oversight. Um, he's made a number of like interesting movies, not just Kaijo movies. Have you ever seen uh, Attack of the Mushroom People or Matango? I've seen clips of Attack of the Mushroom People. I have not seen I think Matango. you'd find that movie interesting. It's, there's a lot of neat ideas in that movie visually. He was clearly a talented guy. Um, he also made some just non-monster movies, I think, with Toho. And, uh, and I can't remember the names, but I remember people looking into them and sort of being sort of underrated and interesting. Um, he's, a, he's definitely a, a workman type director, but he clearly has control over his craft and sort of um, invests energy and sincerity into what he makes in a way that I think is really, I really appreciate it. And I think it gives long longevity to his movies. So they play well now still. Um, but another interesting thing about him is we've mentioned he worked at Toho, but you know, Toho was a big studio in Japan around this time. And uh, he also worked as like an assistant cameraman and uh, second director uh, on a lot of like really high profile Kurosawa movies. Particularly at the end of Kurosawa's life, when he was starting to lose his eyesight, uh, Ishiro Honda was key. He was instrumental in uh, bringing movies like uh, Kagamusha, I'm going to say, and Ron to the screen, which Ron is probably one of my favorite Kurosawa movies. It's it's talked about a lot. But yeah. Oh, there's Baragon. Yeah. Useless. He didn't fucking help at all. The 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 Gamera monster Barugan is much better than Baragon. Oh yeah. The the goofy faced one that shoots rainbows out of Barugan. his back. Barugan. Manda didn't do anything either. Thank you. Yeah. You you work much better as just like a look at the cool monsters that live in this ecological monster land. But oh, God, I just wish I didn't see Rodan's Rodan. Rodan. <laughs> He's just dancing. He almost looks like, hey, oh, there it is. And hey. then it does the weird snap zoom, like, wait a minute, what? What the fuck was that? I and think, the characters don't say anything. I think that might have been footage from a different movie, honestly. Um, <laughs> this is the most abrupt and weird part of this movie, is this weird flying squirrel that just watches things happen. It doesn't fuck up any other places either. It just It's entirely passive. It's just kind of along for well, the ride. They were like, oh, we have all these monsters under our control now. And they're just like, what are we going to do with that? Yeah, fuck it. Let's leave it there. It's fine. <laughs> we got all the monsters back. Oh, we're missing the squirrel. You know what, guys? <laughs> I'll see you Monday. It's, it's fine. fine. <laughs> yeah. So this has been Destroy All Monsters. The end. Uh, I hope you guys had a fun time. I hope um, this might motivate you to go back and look at different kaiju movies with maybe a different... A perspective, a different eye for things in the movie. Um, or just watch them like you did when you were a kid and watch for some sure. colorful, fun monsters fighting things and some wonderful, fun miniatures. And I think the thing that I re enjoy about these types of movies oh, Kira Kubo is in this too. He was in a num- number of Kurosawa movies as well. Um, but anyway, one of the things I think we really enjoy about this movie is just the idea of examining them in a timeline and series. Uh, this is just. 
you know, we, you can obviously compare this to the Avengers and how it's like a team up of different monster yeah. movies. Right. And that has been, the Avengers was absolutely not the first type of franchise to do this. It goes back really far. Yeah. You can even do silent serials, right? Where different like characters from silent serial movies would team up or like be in each other's movies or whatever. Before the failed dark, uh, dark universe, we had like, actually had like the universal monster. Yeah, like, that too. Te- like fighting each That's other. That's even fucking 20 years before this. Yeah. The Abbott and Costello cinematic universe where they met all those monsters. So like this is a thing that's happened, but I think this is a good, this is a really good iteration of that type of like franchise production um, where you have these uh, sort of, I want to say hero type characters. You could probably compare Kaiju to heroes as well. Yeah. And it's just fun to watch the different iterations of them over time. Some are going to be better than, than others because these are, you know, properties that are going to be exploited. But when you have it in the hands of somebody who's creative, they can probably do something that's interesting. And because there's such a strong sort of commitment to the premise and just the artifice and the enjoyment of doing this, uh, a lot of them sort of stand up and, Uh, I think you can really enjoy them easily. You can just dive right into it. And there is still variation. This is a very different movie from Gojira, the original one. Yes. So there's a lot to be, I think, enjoyed in this series of movies. And I would encourage people to go back and watch these original ones, um, maybe even before the new one. I like Michael Doherty as a director, but I have to imagine that you have an idea maybe of what to expect from that type of movie. Whereas with these you're going to find things that are weird. <laughs> you're going to go going in blind. Yeah. I am excited for the new movie. Um, I like yeah, Doherty as a director. Um, I like the fact that we're getting 11 from stranger things as the inevitable little girl who talks to Mothra. Um, but I- I'm excited for that. And Hey, if it's bad, Japan will make a better one <laughs> within a year. There's that's plenty what they of always good ones. Do. Yeah. It's always going to come back around. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I think we've pretty much covered everything we need to. Yeah, it's it's a grand old time. I'm fucking shocked looking at this now that the flying squirrel shithead is on the poster. I, I was thinking about that poster. I would love to have that <laughs> in my room. That's a wonderful poster. Um, oh, I thought you were going to say as a tattoo. No. Yeah, a full back tattoo of Destroy All Monsters. Um, you would just get it on your hands so you can look at it? Yeah. Just <laughs> What's the point of getting a back tattoo of a cool poster? You can never see it. But anyway... Um, <laughs> This has been the Spectator Film Podcast. I'm Max. He's Austin. We are available on Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, and our website, spectatorfilmpodcast.com. Dot gov. Dot edu. At at hotmail. Dot t-o-a-t-s-t. At hotmail.com. But, yes, uh, join us next week when we'll be doing the classic film Shark Boy and Lava Girl. Ooh, No. I have nothing to say to that. Yeah, I'll come up with some other better movie, though. (laughs) (laughs) We don't want to dissuade people from returning. Okay. (laughs) Goodbye, everyone. (laughs)